Hey guys, just before I was coming out to shoot this video, I stumbled across some of the native psilocybin mushrooms here in Ecuador. This one is psilocybin cubensis, uh, commonly referred to as a golden teacher. And these are some of the most potent in the world, Penelis cyanesin. So that was a cool find that I thought I would share with you guys. Okay, so it's time for another subscriber Q&A. If you are a subscriber and you would like to have one of your questions answered, please put it in the comments below. It's been a really interesting and exciting couple of weeks. There's been a storm of synchronicity. If you've been following my videos, you know that I mentioned that I felt like once I really started diving into that subject matter, that that kind of energy and those expressions of the universe would probably reappear in my life to a much higher degree than they have. And that has certainly been the case. Uh, in fact, my last video, there's actually a demonstration of synchronicity that's pretty extraordinary. And when I answer a question relating to that video, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So please do watch all the way to the end, hit the like button, share, subscribe, and let's get to the first question, which is how do we know that whether or not the DMT entities are demonic from Dose of Reality 420? I think that we don't know. And I don't think anyone really knows for sure what they are, whether they have any real objective exist existence of their own. I'm compelled to say that they do because I've received a tremendous amount of information that no one could possibly know from these beings or voices that you encounter with ayahuasca or DMT. Um, <clears throat> as far as what their nature is, uh, I've certainly many times felt this sort of unsettling, you know, especially with like the jesters, uh, and it's just so strange and foreign. I think that there's something that could be just inherently threatening in that, and it doesn't necessarily speak to the nature of the beings. But I think it's important to judge by the effect that they have in their message. And overwhelmingly, it seems like people come back from an ayahuasca or a DMT experience saying, you know, the universe is an eternal sea of consciousness. I believe in an afterlife now. Uh, the universe is just a pure sea of love. and all of these really positive life affirming things. So I would say that because the effect that encounters with these beings have on people, I think it's pretty unlikely that they're anything negative. Even when people have negative experiences, they generally are thankful after the effect because they've learned something profound and important. So I, I don't think that that is a, a major concern. And from Tim C, how do we know that synchronicity isn't a fundamental expression of the universe? Well, let's look at the word fundamental. Um, synchronicities are fun, and it's certainly mental. So, absolutely, synchronicity is fundamental, and I'm kind of being a wise ass, but um, I kind of struggle with this. The, the idea of consciousness manifesting these coincidences, or whether we're precognizing things. Um, if you've been following my videos, you know that in the last couple of weeks, I've had a bunch of experiences that are pretty compelling evidence that we do have the capacity to inject experiences into our into our world. Um, for example, the other day there was a coral snake um, that I hadn't seen in a year and that morning I, I said I'm gonna see that snake today and then the snake was sitting on the porch and it could have been a different coral snake but the point is these two snakes, right, that's the only time I've seen that type of snake. So that was interesting and then the next day it happened again. I am in Ecuador, you'd think there's a lot of snakes here, but honestly, we hardly ever see them. So it is sort of unusual. And I came out off the mountain, and a neighbor walks up to me, and he says, I have something to show you. And I was like, a snake, right? So the best one, um, and actually you can look at this yourself, my uh, last video, The Phoenix Process. Uh, at one point in the video, I'm talking about how I'm, I'd made a video about the 1111 synchronicities. And you know, the cards that I put so you can clink and I'll, I'll put one somewhere up there uh, to link to this video so you guys can check this out. I had mentioned the 1111 synchronicity video that I made, which is a video about coincidences involving 211s. And when I was looking for the, you know, minute marker to put the card, it took forever. And finally, I checked at 1111, and you hear the words 1111 come out of my mouth if you click right on the 1111 minute and second. I mean, it lines up perfectly. And of course you could accuse me of having done that during editing. It's a 30 minute video it was shot in like three different locations over a period of a few weeks. Um, and it wasn't even in sequence. We had to put the, you know, put them in order. So the chances of that just happening, I think are, are, are pretty slim. I'm not sure exactly what's being asked. I mean, so I'll answer it in terms of, is this something that we're generating 
or I am compelled to think that there's a relationship with consciousness because of the conceptual continuity. It's not like these are random, meaningful coincidences. They're generally linked in such a way that they connect to each other uh, and you can learn to actually interpret and use them to sort of decode the universe and your relationship and your story even can come to light through this process of synchronicity. So I would say that, of course, it's a fundamental expression of the universe. I think this idea that, that matter in the universe is somehow consciousness, fundamentally, that, you know, the all is mind, from the Kabbalion, this, this, this statement is a literal truth. Um, it, it could be taken just to mean that all we know of the universe is our perceptions, and so our experience is totally mental. But I think it, it does mean something deeper than that, and I think that as you expand your consciousness, you take down these filters that have developed for a purpose there, um, a, an evolutionary tactic to screen out geometries and energy manifestations that are not pragmatic. Um, and now that we're moving into a different type of existence, they're relevant. And so we are finding ways through plant medicine and yoga and meditation to develop new capacities of mind and synchronicity is part of that experience. What do you think of the climate hoax from John Doe? I think that the earth warms and cools uh, naturally over long periods of time and I think that it would be very difficult to discern absolutely whether or not mankind really contributes to that. However, being a magician is fundamentally about understanding the laws of cause and effect and the laws of the universe and you cannot impact any constituent part of existence without impacting all of it. All of the coal that we've burned, all of the, the exhaust from the cars, all of the pollution we've dumped into the ocean, all of this stuff, all of this unnatural, all the frequencies that are being emitted from the 5G and, and, and from cell phones, some of those things might not contribute directly to global warming, but to infer that people are somehow fabricating this climate hoax in order to justify a tax. I don't remember being asked if I could be taxed. I don't think that the logic sounds that sound to me. Um, are there manipulations in the media in every realm? I would imagine so. But the fundamental message here is that we need to live in a more mindful, conscious way and to try to minimize our toxic output. And we have ways to do that. We have solar, we have wind, we have, I mean, lots of options. Don't, don't buy plastic bottles, use refillable stuff. You know, do you really want whales washing up on the ocean full of plastic? To me, it doesn't matter whether it's a hoax or not. Obviously, we need to change the way that we live so that we are more harmonious with our environment. Obviously, it's gonna have an impact if we don't. And it looks to me and a lot of scientists that are looking at this, some of them think that we're on the edge of an extinction event. So it doesn't even matter to me, I guess, is the answer. If, if there's some element of exaggeration or whatever, people need to change. Okay, from Itosh, are the Goetic spirits real or are they parts of the mind as Aleister Crowley thought? Both, I would say, for those of you that might not know what Goetia are, um, uh, they're specifically referring to the demons that were summoned by King Solomon to build his temple and to gain, bring him knowledge and all of this sort of stuff. And um, I think that it's very difficult for us to discern whether something in the nature of a spirit is actually, actually real. The, the old magicians may have been thinking about it as a psychological exercise, and this is why you have a demon of gluttony, you have a demon of lust, you have a demon of greed. These are all aspects of our psychological makeup that if they are under control can serve us and if we are under their control we serve nothing, not even ourselves. We might think that we're serving ourselves but we're not. So, um, and I should also correct you a little bit there, Aleister Crowley did not necessarily think they were just parts of our mind. He never made up his mind. This metaphysical stuff we're always going to end up with a couple of possibilities at best. Um, a resolution to one single solid absolute answer is generally not very likely. And I think that, um, I'll paraphrase uh, the intro to Aleister Crowley's Magic and Theory and Practice since we have brought him up. 
and he says something along the lines of, you know, this book is a book of conjurations, sephiro, spirits, demons, and angels, none of which may be objectively real. It is of no real importance whether they are real or imaginary. What is important is that if you do certain things, certain things follow. So getting too hung up on the objective existence of the DMT entities or the goetic spirits, I can tell you that uh, from my practice of ritual magic, I've had experiences that indicate to me that these things are capable of expression on the physical plane. The extent to which that is true is, is not necessarily clear. And so this idea that if you do certain things, certain results will follow, I think the fact that you can get any kind of response in terms of a manifestation that's directly related to an intention from your consciousness, that's probably real enough. Robert Anton Wilson said in regards to these things um, that they are real but not in the same way that the IRS is real. And I think that's a pretty good guideline. I think that it, it doesn't really matter that much whether these things are extensions of our own consciousness because, you know, from my, my metaphysics, my, my viewpoint, my worldview, however you want to say it, um, everything is a part of your mind on some level. It, this is all somehow just generated by consciousness. And so if you are trying to engage with dark areas of consciousness or the unknown, you, you definitely need to be prepared. Uh, one of the biggest shocks of my life was to discover that if you mess around with magic, stuff actually happens. I definitely was not prepared for that. When I started to investigate this stuff, I kind of expected that I would disprove it to my own satisfaction and move on with my life. I, I, I had no idea that I was actually at opening this, this Pandora's box kind of rabbit hole. Um, and if you really want to know for yourself, have a direct experience, it is said that the Enochian calls, if you have a person that doesn't believe in magic or spirits and they want to find out for sure, master an Enochian call, perform it, and you are guaranteed a response. However, it is said that almost inevitably bad things happen to people that do this. And I would say that the chances of stirring up some kind of shitstorm, messing around with the Goetia, is quite likely, even if it is your own psyche. So I would definitely advise that if you're asking me this question because you're considering engaging in any of these areas of consciousness, make sure that you are prepared and that you take the proper precautions and you should probably have some guidance before you start performing Enochian calls or trying to summon demons and bind them to do your will. And I should say also it's very important that the, that is actually the main function of the Western magician to constrain the forces of darkness to work for the light. It's an honor and a privilege to find yourself with that capacity, with that duty, but I think there is an element of legitimate danger. So I would say, you know, are they real? It depends on what your definition of that, that is. But if, if you're asking me if you uh, engage in um, summonings or conjurations or Enochian calls, if you go messing around with this stuff, you're, you're very likely to get some kind of response. And the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is um, something that you definitely need to do every day if you're going to consider uh, opening these doors and portals. I've noticed actually recently that a lot of people seem to be really concerned about the idea that there are like parasitic entities or malvolent spirits that are going to gain some kind of influence over them. This is probably much less of a concern than a lot of people seem to think, and I have a couple of reasons for that. My uh, view or understanding of the laws of the spiritual plane, one of them is that our will is sovereign and divine and equal to that of the Most High God because we are literally a part of the Most High God, and it's like your hand or an eyeball, which would you rather lose? You know, they're all just parts of the thing. So this sort of like old slave religion idea of like bowing down to God and whatnot, and this new paradigm, it's not like you don't have respect for divinity, but you don't really think of yourself as like this groveling lesser than thing, and that applies to lesser spirits as well. So I don't think that they have the divine right, if they are real, to influence us in ways that do not serve us without our permission. And if you're really worried about this anyways, it may help to watch my Mastering Fear video. Um, I'll put a link to that. 
uh, the universe demonstrated for me in extraordinary ways when it was teaching me how fear is actually the energy that draws the thing to you that you're afraid of. So if you can master your energy to the extent that you have no fear, nothing's going to harm you. And so if you, to relate this back to the, the topic at hand, if you are concerned about parasitical entities or malevolent spirits influencing you, your fear of that happening is likely to make you a target. You're going to become sort of like a beacon for this energy. And there is a ritual called the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. There are lots of great videos online that will walk you through how to do this. Um, I'll probably make a video on it eventually. And it serves great as just a meditation if you don't believe in magic. It's still an excellent tool. And it involves basically formulating what you will accept in your universe, expelling everything out, and using this protective seal of the pentagram to seal these energies outside of your circle. And there's also one for invoking them in. So, you know, in the beginning of the day, you'd bring in the energies and influences that you want in your circle. And at the end of the day, you banish them all. And this is an extremely powerful ritual in almost all of the modern occult schools. It is prescribed to the beginning magician to do twice a day for a year. And um, I have had experiences with it that suggest that there's definitely more to it than like mumbling mumbo jumbo. But I don't want to ruin it for you in case you start doing the ritual. So it's something you're going to have to find out on your own. So the last question is what is the best way to integrate plant medicine um, from Blueker's? The interesting thing about the answer to this question is that it is, in my opinion, much more so about what you do to prepare. Integration should happen in the moment if you are properly prepared and you maintain a certain presence of mind. One of my next videos is going to be something along the lines of like a psychedelic masterclass about integration. It's going to depend on a lot of factors. It's going to depend on what your intentions are, what your levels of trauma are, what exactly are you taking these entheogens and psychedelics and plant medicines looking to gain. And I think that there is a tendency in the in some parts of the entheogenic or psychonaut community where people aren't thinking holistically enough we're not using enough meditation to integrate we're not focusing on developing our willpower and discipline um, we're not focusing on our physical health as much as maybe we could for me this is another thing I'm going to document I'm trying to at 40 you know get myself physically in a much better shape to correct any aberrations in my dietary protocol uh, everything you can possibly do to ab absolutely maximize your potential as a conscious awakened being, this is what integration is really about. And also taking responsibility. If it's true that once you get these filters down and you clear out your trauma and your fear, because these things are like uh, an interference pattern. The divine signal, the ego is another one. The divine signal coming through, if you have these fears and this, this energy of interference, uh, it's going to become difficult to, to make yourself a fit receptacle for the forces that you're trying to attract. You want to become a hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven. And if you're full of crap, then you, know, you can't fill a cup that's already full. So it's very important that you're focused in the beginning on dealing with yourself resolving your personal traumas, dealing with yourself on an emotional level, having a very clear intent about what you're going to do. And you might even set up a protocol over some time period, like a year, and know which plant medicines are going to be dealing with what aspects of your psyche, because they all do deal with different levels of our being. Ayahuasca tends to be more of an emotional and physical thing. San Pedro tends to be more cerebral and it has to do a lot with information and the psilocybin tends to be about depression and rebuilding the brain and so you need to know which medicines you're taking at what time and I actually do have kind of a protocol that I think you know they sort of um, sequentially lead into each other if done properly and so your objective is to get through these emotional levels and then to get to the spiritual level and then you want to discover who you are what your real purpose is and then format yourself, condition yourself, program your own being to be as adept at actualizing the expression of your true will as that is humanly possible. And so one of the best ways to do this, start with lower doses of whatever it is that you're using and maintain your focus. You can prepare for this going in by doing a meditation where you will pick a simple geometry like a square or a circle give it a color and try to hold it in your mind's eye without any changes. Every time it fluctuates, changes colors, lines move, start over. 
and see how long you can hold it and practice and practice and practice. And then when you go into the psychedelic state, you have the capacity to focus the mind. Because if you give way to astonishment, if you become like a flag blowing in the wind, you're not going to gain as much. You really have to develop your capacity for concentration, to learn to control your energetic being, sitting and meditating and just kind of feeling where you're at and learning to use the breath to influence the sort of feeling of like static. Like when you blow on coals and they kind of like light up, you're kind of doing the opposite with the breath and cooling and stilling everything. And then once you've accomplished this, you try to focus, change the type of meditation from stillness to focus. And so if you do that practice for a while before going into it, have a very clear intention, and you take it in the right place for the right reasons with the proper preparation, integration is going to be much less of an issue for you. So preparation for the experience is going to be the primary importance for integration. Um, and I think that one of the most neglected and undervalued aspects of this is learning as much as you can about the neurobiology, the neurochemistry, look at these studies that have been done, the brain scans. This will not only give you, I think, a greater capacity to consciously direct what happens in the mind because you understand the way that it works. And I think there's something to be said for that. Conscious connection to the processes that are happening in the body when you're trying to reprogram and rewire your neurocircuits, having an understanding of how that plays out on the physical plane, the, the chemistry involved and the biology involved is gonna be hugely important. It's very important as well to prepare yourself to actually change. This is one of the things that I see most commonly is that people that have been living in the matrix world, they know that there's something wrong with that. They, they know that they have like Babylon sickness or whatever you want to call it, um, but they're not really prepared to let go of their old ideas. And if you go into a strong psychedelic experience with a bunch of resistance, this is where you get into trouble. And so it's very important to make sure that you have prepared yourself to cooperate. You know, I, I see a lot of people uh, go into the experience and then when the beings come and they want to show you something and um, it's interesting that they do imply that you need to move around this space as if it's a physical place, not like they can just like manifest something and show it to you, although they do that as well. But many times I've heard people talking about, you know, they're saying, come with me and they resist and it, it turns into kind of a nightmarish scenario because you have gone into this experience and then once you're there you're not cooperating and that's because you're clinging to your old paradigm also putting limitations on what you can gain from the experience this is another reason that i was recommending you know doing some studying in terms of like the neurobiology and and the actual physiological changes that happen in the brain uh, because i think that it's important to understand that the capacity for these substances to initiate growth and catalyze your consciousness and increase your metaphysical metabolism is much higher than can reasonably be expected. And it's also very important, and I think this is probably the hardest part uh, during integration, and, and this is where, you know, if you're coming from a very, uh, I don't know, normal background, you know that you have a lot of conditioning and programming, um, and you're gonna have a hard time letting go, uh, uh, having someone to talk to, of course, an integration specialist, if you can stay in touch with your shaman if that's possible, or you know, find someone beforehand that can help to guide you. I'm available for that, I do that. Um, we can do it on Skype. Uh, when the parameters of your experience begin to actually change, it can be a very unsettling and disturbing process. And there's really no substitute for having an experienced guide that you can touch base with and kind of check in with if you're not feeling grounded. Um, and there's, you know, things like rape that can help, I think, after the process, using a little bit of tobacco very respectfully, carefully, and ceremoniously can be a huge boost to integration. Hit the like button, subscribe, support us on Patreon, and share this video with anyone you think it might be of importance. Don't miss my psychedelic masterclass video.